This is a great honor. And Dopey Nation, just relax, because it's going to get very, very crazy. <laughs> this is Boston. Boston 2%. I don't know. I guess he discovered Dopey through Facebook. And here and there, people discover Dopey. And they say, I want to come on the show. And I say, send in a voicemail. Send in an email. Boston sent me his book. And it's, <laughs> and it's called uh, Fire and Ice, The Meth Bible. And it is fucking insanity. Thank you for coming here. Thank you so much for having me, man. It's like, I know, I'm sure you expected a real, like, swanky spot, not my dad's apartment in, in Chelsea. I actually love it. I took a three-hour drive, a 3,000-mile plane ride, two Ubers, and a two-hour train ride to be here, and it was worth every freaking minute. Here, here we are. Here we are. And, like, dude, Boston's story is so crazy and and i want to say comprehensively crazy because it stretches i mean how long were, how long were you on drugs for i was in active addiction for 25 years and you came from boston proper i, I live i lived in a town called Reading, massachusetts one of the guys from aerosmith's from there okay well, yeah we, and, we have great roots in in massachusetts yeah we have a great boston group of, of dopes so they they know about it so you came up in, in Reading in the suburbs, stoners, paradise of the 90s. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the first chapter of the book's called Virgin Lungs, and the second one's High School High. And really, it was like to me, it was like Stand By Me on Weed, you know? And it's a group of broken kids who gravitate towards each other with the, the, the box of misfit toys. And, uh, and you know, that's the way it rolls in, in most friend groups. And we, uh, we bonded, we trauma bonded. And then all of a sudden we started, uh, we found that first half a joint in a parliament pack and, uh, we were under a bridge in Reading, Massachusetts. And we were off and fucking running, man. And even before that though, you had fallen in love with alcohol, right? No, it was after that. That was about 12 years old, about 12, 13. And then the summer going into eighth to ninth grade, I remember my first drink. And I put it in the book, you know, the story based on that. And I remember taking the first swig of cheap Underwood and Pierce vodka and orange juice. I was with my buddy, this Irish kid. And, uh, and I remember it hitting my stomach and an instant chemical reaction takes place. And I remember thinking a thought, like I heard my own voice in my head and I said, that is what I'm fucking talking about. I want to feel like this the rest of my life. And you had alcoholic roots, family. I grew up in an alcoholic home and there was also a dark mental illness present. I suffered childhood trauma and I had the alcoholic gene. I mean, every male in my family going back a hundred years or more is, has been an alcoholic. And, uh, you know, so all the seeds were there. The perfect storm was there. It was, I was destined to be on drugs and alcohol for sure. When you talk about childhood trauma, like specifically, like when you look back, what do you, what do you recognize? broom handles to the head, orange electrical cords, casserole dishes, being stabbed with a candlestick. Um, Your folks. Yeah. And I never tell, say which one, but uh, but yeah, it, it left some scars. I'm going to say it was your mother. It, it, it might have been. <laughs> <laughs> she, my parents are both, they're dead now anyway. Okay. So yeah, I talk about it a little freely, but yeah, it was it was really bad, man. And you would you say you medicated it? Absolutely. I mean, it was, I mean, the love affair I had with alcohol, I was an everyday vodka drinker at 14. I was suppressing deep, deep childhood trauma. And, uh, and you know, it was like verbal too. So there was a lot of hurt feelings and shit like that. So and it, it was an instant, you know, it, it killed everything instantly. All the childhood trauma drained like water in a bathtub. And I, I loved it. And instead, you 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 had your friend group who you were like crazy tight with, yeah. And you just got fucked up with them on a daily basis. Yeah, we used to call ourselves the Hood Kids. You know, we lived in this affluent white community outside of Boston, like ten minutes north of Boston. I mean, the town was basically cursed—a huge, huge drug problem. So I mean, we we were doing. I remember cocaine, fourteen, like the alcohol came, and then I just said, "Give me it all right away." So it was alcohol, cocaine, oxycontin heroin, benzodiazepines, like I had tons of, uh, you know, the green colonopins and all that, like anything I could get my hands on, I was doing. 
more. What was like the favorites? Like if like it, before you, because you wound up moving to Texas at how old? Uh, I I was moving. I moved to Texas later on, like in my early twenties. So like the ones I loved to abuse in high school were the booze was my number one. I loved cocaine, but I I fell in love. I'm a motorhead man. I love the Adderall and the Ritalin. I used to do Ritalin like crazy, man. It was that's where my my uh, my love affair with methamphetamines actually began. Were you ADD? Uh, I might have been, but I don't think so. I think I just, I just, I just think I loved it. And I love the sexual aspect of speed. Yeah. When did you first discover the sexual aspect of speed? In high school when I first started doing it. <laughs> oh yeah, there's a great, that great scene where you guys go away to some cabin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we were, uh, we were actually up at this mansion. You know, it was like a haunted mansion yes. in North Andover, Massachusetts. You know, we used to go up there and party, and uh, yeah, it's it was wild, man, just free for all. And like, how how quickly, like, because one of the great themes of Fire and Ice, the meth bible, is is sex and speed. Yeah, and and, and like, it's funny how brain chemistry is different, and how different drugs hit different people in right. whatever kind of different way. And like, when's the first time you remember amphetamines hitting your system? Uh, I had to be like 15 years old or so. I mean, me and the, there's there's a guy coming to meet me here later today, and there was another kid that we were both friends with, and you know, I was I was crushing Ritalin up and snorting it right off of my uh, my book cover in art class while the teacher had his back turned and he was doing something on the board. We were ripping lines right there in the classroom, man. So I fell in love with it then. And was, did anyone know, did parents know, did teachers know? When did people start finding out? Nobody gave a fuck about me back then. I mean, I'd show up to school dead drunk. You know, I, I remember my typewriter class, the teacher tripped and broke her head off the desk and I was so drunk on gin, I started laughing and like, I just walked up and left class, you know? And I, I was basically, I basically dropped out of school. I stopped paying attention in sixth grade, man. I have like a sixth grade education. That's why it's amazing I wrote that huge ass book, man. I, it's a giant book. 716 pages of fire. Man. It's an opus. It's an opus to drug addiction and recovery. When I sat down to write it, I remember thinking, I want to write the greatest fucking book about crystal meth that's ever been written. And I think we did that. It is a great, it is, it is it's, but I wouldn't say it's just about crystal meth. You know, it, it, it's a fucking, it's, it's an American travelogue of the 2020s, 20, 2000s, where you fucking travel the country and you, I mean, one of the things that struck me in the book was um, the darkness. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the, the demonic side and, yeah. and the lightness, obviously. When's the first time do you think that supernatural shit interested you? Well, I, I, I usually start the story like this and I say, I was born on January 31st, 1982. The devil tried to kill me that day. And that's the truth. I almost died the day of my birth, and I've been fighting for my damn life ever since. And uh, How did the devil try to kill you on the day of your birth? I was born, like, purple, and they thought I had a hole in my heart. And I, I did, but it was more of a spiritual hole. But all I know is that my dad and my mom would tell me for years, that like, you almost didn't make it the night that you were born, you know. And I pulled through, and then, uh, you know, and then as soon as the drugs and alcohol started, I was a powder keg. I mean, I was I was really bad. A falling down, blacked out, sad, drunk at 14 years old. Star baseball player, gave up everything, lost interest, dropped out of high school in 10th grade, started working at a gas station. I mean, I did hundreds of hits of ecstasy. I was taking anything I could get my hands on to an absolute extreme. Just like I'd never done anything fucking halfway. So my drug addiction wasn't halfway. And then if you look at the size of the book, I didn't write a book halfway and I'm just an extreme person. When do you think you started encountering demons though, or experience, or really being plugged into the supernatural? And, and that's why the book is so popular is because it's it explains the spiritual side of meth. And I would say the first stuff I had to deal with that was when I started getting into the meth game, probably like 2016 17 area so what when you were a kid there were no demon visitations there was no thought of god the devil any of that shit i we were raised catholic but we didn't go to church or nothing besides maybe like once a year okay you know but i will say this like me and my me and my one of my family members 
we were kind of gifted like where we would experience where we would kind of see things coming before they would happen and we would speak it and then it would happen like the next day or whatnot we used to have a running joke and we would say all you got to do is say it you know so i think the gifts were always there and i mean tons of stuff like that happens all the way through today but when i got into the meth game i i was starting to experience vulgar displays of power I mean, stuff that would blow the human mind. I mean, stuff that was physically happening. I don't want to jump ahead too quickly, though. Yeah. How did you, why did you wind up going to Texas in the first place? Well, uh, you know, I, I, that just sets the stage in a way, because Texas is this dark, oh, yeah. fucking rough place. And, and not that Massachusetts isn't, but it's a different kind of subculture. And it's set in the city, Corpus Christi, Texas, which quite literally means the body of Christ in Spanish. I thought that was interesting. God set the stage there. But um, I'll just say this. I turned 21 years old on a Friday night. On Monday morning, I was in my first treatment center, one of nine. What was the first bottom? Um, I, I just got completely fucked up on my 21st weekend. My friends threw me a party at this place in Saugus, Massachusetts. I walked in at like five at night. There was nobody there. And then I, I was just drinking. I looked around. And I'm like, I know everybody in here. The place was packed. Hundreds of people. It's like our whole high school showed up to this party. By Monday, I, I was really in bad shape physically. They took a blood draw and they told me, if you keep drinking, you're not going to see your 25th birthday. And I just went hard. I didn't even see suicide was always the mission for me. My first suicidal thoughts were like 10, 12 years old, somewhere in there, you know? So when I drank, it was suicidal, suicidally drinking. When I did drugs, suicidally doing that too. I mean, it was like, I didn't care. I openly admitted I was an alcoholic, you know? And how conscious, how conscious were you of that? Like, cause when I was using heroin i remember there was there was a time where i was like well if i can take a big enough shot maybe i won't wake up and like yeah. and that that was as close to real suicidal using as i got if if i didn't wake up if i overdosed that would have been okay yeah no big deal it would have been like okay which which could be described as using suicidally because right. why would anybody Put themselves in that situation and this is the other thing like we used to listen to the music that glorified it right and then i loved all the fat comedians chris farley john belushi sam kennison i mean anybody who shoved a, a kilo of cocaine up their nose i i idolized nikki six motley crew i mean i mentioned that in the book like my idols my heroes were all drug addicts and a lot of them were dead but when I when you say that you use suicidally, like was it on the front of your brain that you hoped this would kill you, or was it like I don't give a fuck, I'm gonna use as much as I can, and if I die, I'm dead. That's right. Like I would just I had the mindset that I'm gonna do as much as I can, and if I die, it's gonna be a romantic thing, you know, and and that's what I idolized, so I wanted to emulate that, and and I didn't give a fuck if my heart stopped beating. Right. And you wound up in your first treatment at 22? 21 years old. My 21st birthday. Friday night I turned 21. I was at the bar Thursday night at 12.01. By Monday morning, 9 a.m., I was in my first treatment center. Was that in Mass? It was in Mass. And I start, that's where the treatment center mill started for me. I did nine treatments. Some of the, the East Coast best. I was in McLean and a bunch of them. Yeah. Nothing worked for me. The guy who I started the show with who died went to McLean's and uh, and he's from Massachusetts. Yeah, Chris. And, yeah, and so did uh, James Taylor went to McLean's. Oh, yeah, yeah. That he wrote, uh, I think, Fire, Fire and Rain. Rain yeah. yeah. Was that a big, is there a plaque to James Taylor? I didn't see any James Taylor plaques, <laughs> but I probably didn't see much of anything. I think I was on so many, uh, <laughs> so many uh, benzos when they put me in there. But no. I think that that's the best thing about treatment is that they give you benzos. Right. <laughs> you so you so you leave there and, and I remember reading like you're like, well maybe I can just drink beer. Yeah. Maybe I can just like live and not be clean. My my dad actually that first treatment center, on the way home we bought a twenty pack for me. So it was like on the way home back from rehab I bought it he bought me a twenty pack of beer. How bad of an alcoholic was your dad? Very, very high functioning alcoholic, businessman. 
um super cool guy too he he had his issues but he was nothing like me like he had the gene he was an alcoholic but he went to work every day he was super successful and he didn't know who he was dealing with with you no it, it's almost like the curse rolled downhill like it got worse and worse the snowball the, effect yeah i came from a long line of brilliant people i mean you know my one of my ancestors like my great great grandpa was the chief cardiologist surgeon at harvard university all my family was my grandpa was a doctor my dad was a businessman but it just like kept going downhill as the generations went and the addictions got worse and then i mean i was really bad i'm the i'm the worst of the bunch for sure there's no doubt well for, let's let's hope it let's hope it ends with you that's that's i think it will i mean uh it, you know, we cracked the the curse. I think, like the Red Sox did in '04. You know. Well, it's a, it's a ser- I mean, I think like your story is a serious exorcism. Yeah. Like the demons are drawn out. It's like they they were baked in, and this book fucking exercised the fuck out of them. Yeah, I mean, I was having major spiritual experiences. Like I I just remember like that went on. I started a family when I was in my mid twenties. I thought like when I hit twenty five, I said, okay, you get married at twenty five. That's what you do. So I met a lady, she had a kid already, instant family. So the drugs kind of went away for a while, you know? Very, very seldom, but the booze never left. I was sober for like maybe, I'd say like maybe 11 months. I was sober just enough time, just long enough to start taking hostages. I tricked them into thinking that I was normal. Well, you were very high functioning. You always, you know, excelled at your work. Yeah. One of my favorite stories that, that I remember is like, you get to Texas, you don't know what to do and you get the job at the bar. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, like, you fucking stumble onto, like, El Primo Coke dealer. Yeah. And, like, was that where Coke, like, really starts to become an interest for you? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm bartending at a comedy club and I meet this guy and he gives me a blast in the bathroom. And I'm like, this is, like, pure cocaine. And it was literally, like, an eighth of the price of what I was used to paying back home. And it was unlimited access. And then, you know, you're just doing it out in the open, you know? Did you did you ever get to do comedy on stage? I never did. And and I moved to Vegas when I was 19 to be a stand-up comic. It was like right around the terrible event that happened in New York City. I moved out there two weeks before. And I, I had just taken the ASFAB test. I was going out to Vegas uh, last Wait, minute. What's ASFAB? It, I was joining the National Guard. So I, this is the funny part. I was going to join the National Guard to bridge to law enforcement because I wanted to be an undercover Boston narcotics agent. Well, it's a perfect career for you. Yeah, I would have been great at it. But you're, you're like, you're like, yeah, go back, you're in the departed. You, right. you, you could be the guy. I would have ended up like Harvey Keitel, a bad lieutenant. Yeah, that's right. Possible. But here we are. Here we are. So I think God redirected my life. Uh, because a lot of those guys didn't come home, you know, and it happened two weeks after and it changed the trajectory of my life. Then I moved back home and then we went to Texas shortly after that. So like, oh, three, oh, four. I feel like it was in that same period that see, and, and this is like a topic I find fascinating, but stimulants and pornography. Yeah. And like that double down addiction and the darkness of it. Yeah, I mean, that's a demon. It's like chocolate and peanut butter. Oh, man, that's one of my big demons. Yeah. Chocolate and peanut butter. Chocolate and peanut butter. I have problems with that. Yeah. Serious. And, I mean, like, pornography, and I was a full-blown pornography, full-blown sex addict, and and that's what the book's about. It's really about when you mix meth with, with sex addiction and how dark life can become because you just, you're broken in every single way. This is interesting to me because uh, we've had a lot of people talk about aspects of sex addiction on the show yeah. but when you say you're a full-blown sex addiction a six i'm sorry sex addict what does it look like at that moment so let's just let's just set the stage first please so I'm, i work this very successful career in the vacation rental business i get beaten a couple bad business deals marriage falls apart wife and kids are gone right as they were leaving i started dabbling in, in meth again right I did it when I was in Vegas for a little bit, but I started really like getting a chip on on meth. I was just snorting it. Everybody starts off snorting it. It's real fun. The sex is amazing on it, stuff like that. So it's real attractive. People start snorting it. So then um, when they left, the absence of the sound of my children's feet on the floor 
drove me literally insane. I moved back to my father's house in Corpus Christi because I was living on an island like 30 minutes away. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I get a job as a nighttime cab driver. When you go, and, that, and that's like the entree, that's like highway to hell. That's like cue the music. <laughs> it's gonna get bad. Yes. But, but that's fucking 12 years into your drug addiction. Yeah. So how many treatments have you been to at that point? I, I think I went through all, I think probably like seven or eight at that point. Yeah, no, no, all, all nine of them. All nine. When I became a cab driver, I was done. I never went to treatment after that again. The next part was I I went on a two year purposeful suicide mission in the slimy underworld of crystal methamphetamines and I, and I I went into this thinking I love this drug I am going to kill myself with this drug and that was the main goal of the whole mission right so I move into my dad's I get the job as the nighttime cab driver instantly rolling felony the perfect venue for a junkie. You make your own hours. You can work whenever you want. I worked a 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. I wanted to work at night. The sleaziest of the sleazy. I and mean, Corpus Christi is like a crazy party town. I mean, it's right on the Gulf of Mexico. The drug problem is enormous. And it's just, you know, there's strip clubs, pimps, prostitutes, check cashers, money printers, hustlers drug dealers i mean these are the clientele i mean you're ferrying around the lost souls of the night people that need safe passage um, to fly under the radar of the police and basically my job was to take these people around and then i learned really quickly there was things that i could do to support my drug habit while in the taxi and then i start driving my personal vehicle i'm driving 24 hours a day you don't get out of the car because why would you no i mean it's just it's I mean, I didn't pay for anything or receive anything in money in a long time. It was com it was completely the barter system. Ice was the currency for everything, you know. And I I, I picked up like I I would ferry around a lot of prostitutes. I was friends with a lot of prostitutes. They they paid really good and they just wanted to make sure that they were safe and whatnot. And um, you know, the pornography part of it. You know, when I was doing ice, I mean, I would have my trap house in the country club estates. So my grandparents' old house. Pornography would play in the background literally 24 hours a day, like it was elevator music, you know? And that's completely normal in the meth life. So your grandparents' house became the trap house? Absolutely. And who wound up showing up? Almost every drug addict you can think of in the city at the time. I mean, it was wild. It was a train of homeless drug addicts in and out. And I mean, it was like, um, you know, I had things people needed and wanted, you know, I was never a gangster. I, I brushed shoulders and I worked with a lot of them, but basically I had a place to stay and I had a brand new car and I drove like a cop. I had a Corpus Christi taxi driver's license and, um, and, and I, I had, I had the keys, man, you know, and they don't pull you over in the taxi. They're very politically connected. You know, so it's a very safe thing for people. You're protected because you work for this company. When was the first time you did meth? The first time I did crystal meth, uh, real meth, was in Las Vegas, Nevada, 2001. And it was like, it was that kind of meth back then, out in that city in particular, where you would stay up and you'd lose 10 pounds in three days. It was wild. <laughs> right. That was a sexual nightmare too. I mean, yeah, crazy. And you talk about after you lost your family that your sex addiction really kicked in. Where did it first start showing up before that, though? I'd say, like, the cocaine days, you know. But the thing was, like, back then, I was, like, 350 pounds. So the sex part of it wasn't really an issue. It was a lot more porn than sex. I wasn't a hot commodity back then. And you don't talk about the food addiction aspect. No, but that comes from childhood trauma because that was a reward and a like a, a hush your mouth thing after a, a bad beating. So, soothing. Soothing. Soothe with food. I love you. I'm sorry. Right. You know? So food takes on that role too. Yes. And then, and then the alcoholism fueled the food addiction because I would feel so shitty all the time that I would just, I would comfort eat all day, you know, until I got more of, I, I was a binge drinker at night. But the cocaine was where the pornography started, but then real life crystal meth took it to a whole different level. Because the meth it took off the weight, 
and then all of a sudden you could be a hot commodity in this world. And also you're you're a safe passage for the prostitutes. Right. And you're you're also an alcoholic, right. a drug addict, a food addict, a trauma person. So right. they saw somebody that they knew because it was probably similar to who they were. I actually, I wasn't really with the prostitutes that much, but I would I would pick up like trap house girlfriends and like girls in the game and stuff. And I had a place to stay. So it was a revolving door every three days, I'd get a new one. And then I had a girlfriend for a while and, you know. See, my my drug, drug life was very much like bougie middle class heroin addict like i always yeah. joke about like i wouldn't have been on heroin if i didn't have cable tv right like, i wouldn't have survived right in the street. <laughs> like i just i just wouldn't have. right um i was more of a fan of dvd <laughs> yeah, well, whatever whatever the case was you know right. what i mean like i needed a couch and i needed like a television set yeah for me to really enjoy being a heroin addict right when like i was not running the streets in any kind of way Here, here's the thing about meth the poisonous roots of meth go back to the Japanese. They invented it. Hitler's doctor was giving him shots of pervitin, okay? And that's basically its crystal meth. And he starts giving it to the military. Then he gives it to the entire country as a pet pill, okay? This is all in the book, Blitzed. You can look it up. It's historically accurate. Then he opens a, the, he commissions one of the big chocolate factories in the country. Now, every man, woman, and child is on this drug. And then all of a sudden, the greatest atrocities that the planet's ever seen in war start to happen and he gets obsessed there's a spiritual side to crystal meth okay there's a very demonic side and that's why the book is going crazy is because nobody's ever really talked about what it really looks like he starts looking for the the spear that pierces the side of jesus christ in the bible that's where they got the idea the for right that's where they got the idea but it wasn't the lost ark he was looking for the spear because it's that crazy meth obsession yeah it i this is my opinion, and this is what I found. I mean, millions of views on my TikTok, hundreds of thousands of comments from all different meth addicts that don't know each other all over the world. Everybody that comments, for like, I'd say 95% say that they've had some type of demonic experience. It's made, in a lot of cases, with red phosphorus, which is literally made with burnt bones. It's a psycho voodoo drug that does something chemically to the brain that opens up a spiritual portal. Like it, it takes the veil off to the spiritual world. That's why people are seeing shadow people. That's why people are, it's always an experience with the devil, always. It's always, and it's, I mean, the sex is demonic. It's absolutely wild. But I mean, the meth game, I explained it like no one's ever done before. I told the honest truth about what the crystal meth game really looks like. Everyone is sleeping with each other. Everyone's having crazy sex. Everyone's stealing from stores. Everyone is boosting. Everyone is dealing drugs. It's a it's the craziest lifestyle a person can live, 100%. And it's very evil. So when does it kick in full blast? I'm driving the taxi, and now I'm smoking it like crazy while you're driving. Um, yeah, it's j it's, I mean, it's always on me. You know what I mean? And then I start poking the needles, you know. I, when I was in the treatment center mill, I got introduced to needles for the first time. I, I learned how to do drugs more hardcore in treatment than anything else. So to tell us how that, that how, I, I, the first time I, I ever shot up was I was in treatment. Yeah. And uh, and some dude, my roommate was like, we should get out of here. I was like, okay, I have money. He's like, yeah. great. I know where to get heroin. I was like, great. And we went home and he's like, you're not snorting heroin anymore. We're shooting it. Now. Yeah. And then I never snorted heroin. It's before. a waste. Exactly. <laughs> so what was the first time you, uh, you shot? I shot, uh, with a chick that I met in rehab and I actually, I did, you know, I'd said Nikki six was one of my heroes in addiction. I watched that behind the music and I was shooting up, uh, smeared off vodka and heroin. And then, um, that not was in the treatment. No, no, no. We, we left treatment. And we were at her house. You AM it. Yeah, we AM it. And then we were, or I finished, and then I got out, and then we, we met up afterwards. I think she was like a veterinarian or some shit. Beautiful. <laughs> was there any ketamine involved? No. Okay. She probably did it all herself. So you, you had learned how to shoot, and... Have you ever shot crystal meth? I have, in yeah. L.A. And, um, you know, I... I it's meth... a very sexual drug for women when they do it that way. I never even got to have meth sex. What? I didn't. I, I maybe I, I probably masturbated a bunch. Yeah. But it was like I got to Los Angeles 
coming out of Florida. And I'm going to say this very quickly, just so you know my math history. Yeah. The show, the show. These guys know. That. Yeah. I left Florida. I moved to LA. My best friend, who died in the show, my not the guy who I set up the show, but my best friend died six weeks before he died oh, wow. of fentanyl. He had stopped doing heroin. Uh, he had stopped doing coke, and he didn't. T and I left treatment to go live with him. He didn't tell me that he had started doing meth. Right. So when I got to LA, he is two weeks into meth addiction. Right. And I was like, okay, I'll smoke meth with you. And we would smoke meth. And as soon as I smoked meth, I knew I wanted downers. Like yeah. I knew that this wasn't for me, and I wanted downers. Right. And I smoked meth until I got downers. And then I was like, I just want heroin. So I would just put heroin in with the meth and I would only shoot meth alone if I ran out of heroin. It's called a goofball. It is called a goofball. Yeah. <laughs> one of the better one of the better names for right. combinations of drugs. Right. And and you know it's like, like nobody's respected for goofballing. Nobody's respected for goofballing. And and I you know I used to love uh doing ice and Molly. Like that was a big one. And how would you do it? Um I would usually just eat it. I would eat the Molly, you know in the morning like to come down but you know i never came down i was i did i had like a over 750 day run on meth it was nuts were you doing the molly with the meth in texas yes in it, the driver job yeah yeah oh yeah so you'd be tell us more i want to know more i mean we're just cruising <clears throat> through the neon slime i mean it's trap house after trap house picking girls up at strip clubs it's um it's houses of ill repute, prostitution. I mean, just, you know, anything you can think of. I mean, we're driving around. I mean, it's literally 24 hours a day. There's always somewhere where to go. You know, people are calling in personal calls and stuff like that. Like, come pick me up. They request you, type of stuff like that. I'm just realizing something. Mm -hmm. There was a footnote in the middle of this tidal wave of debauchery, yeah. which was, you got married and have children. Yeah. How did that happen in the middle? Well, it was, that was before the, the crazy, right? Yeah. So that was what led up to the breakup of that was what led me to the two year long suicide attempt with meth. But nobody ever told me that meth rarely kills you. It takes you to parts of Hades that most people don't even know exist. It blows the human mind. And what it does is it drives you absolutely insane. Okay. So it leads to mental illness, really. And a lot of people do die from it. A lot of, I think they say the life expectancy of a meth addict is about seven years, but I think it's more the lifestyle that kills you than the actual drug itself. The no food and the insanity. And no water. I wouldn't drink water for five days. But I want to know just, and I, I know you don't love talking about your family and in, in, around this stuff. Yeah. But it seems like important just to know mm -hmm. soulfully. Like out of nowhere, you meet this woman and you start a family. And, and I could tell from what I read in the book, you loved your family. I loved my family. I was an alcoholic when that happened. Okay, I wasn't really doing drugs. But then when that all broke up is when I left. And then I didn't want to pretend to be a dad and a junkie at the same time. So I cut every all my children off. The biggest thing about the ice game, I talk about this in the book. I see, I've had it happen a million times and I've also, I've, I've watched and it happens to women a lot, okay? So you'll be partying with a group of girls, you know, if you want to call it that. And um, and then all of a sudden somebody will just break down in, in big soggy tears, like, you know, somebody died type of tears. There's moments where you remember your children and you won't think of them for weeks or months. And then all of a sudden. And then you get this moment of clarity. And then what happens is, it's immediate, you just see people shake it off, they go back and they use immediately, and they usually use a huge dose because it's like, just forget. Just forget because it's you're in this realm, and people used to call it the realm, which is like, it's like a kingdom, and it's really a kingdom of darkness. And I've heard people refer to it as the realm so many times. And everybody's playing a character, right? So you reinvent yourself into this evil larger than life character and everybody's got a nickname in the game everybody's got a job everybody's got a niche everybody's got something they're famous for you know and it's really all just a bunch of bullshit and none of those people are your friends at all and when i get incarcerated later on i'll tell you about that so the family breaks up yeah and then and and just so the audience knows you are in touch with your kids now yeah which which is 
beautiful and yeah and just like the most important thing i think it was totally restored so at the end of that i mean i and i i talk about this to give other people hope and i and i tell this story because i want people to know that if you've done something like this it's not the end and there is hope for restoration when i was in the middle of the divorce I actually, I was so strung out. I was going to sign the divorce papers. I was in a bank. We had to be, have it notarized. And I ended up saying, I'll sign them if you give me a hundred bucks. And I actually signed away the rights to my children within those divorce papers. Now, this is the thing about that. She was absolutely right for doing that. She was protecting my children. I thank God that that happened. Because she's a good mom. She's a good mom. She's a good mom today. She protected those kids. And now everything today is fully restored. But there had to be a lot of miracles. There had to be a lot of change. And your sanity else. needs to be maintained. Absolutely. <laughs> the basis. There are certain substances I cannot touch. I mean, medically. I mean, it, you know, and, and I'll, I'll tell that story. The life of crime, the stuff like that. I'm going to tell the story about the wheelchair just because people ask me about it. And it's like one of the, the worst. There was an old lady on the side of the road. Okay. I like how you start the story. Yeah. There's an... <laughs> This is like the there setup. once was an old lady on yeah, the side of I mean, the road. Yeah, I mean, this is three o'clock in the morning, right. and this is Boston born again, by the way, in the book. Okay, so you know, driving down the road, this lady's struggling to get over the curb in in the wheelchair. Okay, and then uh, you know, good Samaritan pulls over, right? And you know, I help her up, and I'm like, hey, do you do you need a ride? She didn't have any money, so I'm like, all right. She's like, I'm going to this store up here, and I said, okay, that's going by my house, and I'm like, I'm about to go on a break. And then, um, and I drive, but I had to go into my house because I had to go get loaded real quick. I was like starting to get tired. So I went in and, uh, yeah. And she, she demanded to come with me and I'm like, okay. And I'm like, I mean, that's how messed up your thinking is. Like, this is a stranger just getting high in front of a stranger alone is weird. How old an old lady was she? She was older. <laughs> <laughs> she was in a wheelchair. Okay. Yeah, and then I mean, one one thing led to another, and those two crazy kids, you know, one of them being you, and yeah, one of them being the old lady in the wheelchair. <laughs> yeah. So there's a story based on that in the book. It's wild. I recommend you get it. But uh, yeah, and it's like, and then I remember dropping her off after. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Yeah. In the story, you had sex with the old lady in the wheelchair. Yeah. Did you do math with her? She. I think she took a hit. She took a hit. And did you sit in the wheelchair and she sat on you? No, 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 no. <laughs> but I ended up throwing, I found her ID in the back of the taxi and I threw it out the window. I was so ashamed. Wow. Yeah. And where did you take the old lady? To the store up the street that she was originally going to, you know? And then, uh, yeah, it was disgusting. And I mean, it was just like that all the time. It was just meeting people and randomly sleeping with people. I mean, all the time, every single day, you know? And that's just, it's not just me. That's the life. That's the game. If you go, see, that's why it's demonic. Because if you go to any city in the United States, the devil sets his carnival up in every major city and in every little town and every little trailer park in between. And every trap house looks exactly the same. Tell me about trap house life. I really feel like I missed out on meth sex, by the way. Yeah, you did. I really did. Yeah. Okay, tell me about the, the trap house life. Because I didn't do any of that. Trap house life is wild. I mean, it's like around the clock nothing ever closes trap house is 24 hours a day it's like walmart you know and um there's always i describe it in the book there's people selling food stamps 50 cents on the dollar but like uh, how do you find a trap house and what like your grandparents house wound up becoming a trap just house. follow the smell of anhydrous man you know and i mean in, in flower bluff texas i mean there's one on every block you know and and they're popping up like back here on the east coast man when I was growing up, you never heard of meth. You never saw meth. Meth has spider webbed all over the place. And people that I've grown up with are telling me that meth is a monstrous problem in the city of Boston, New York, everywhere. It's a it's 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 very, very big in the gay world in New York. Right. It, in New York it's it's always been more I mean, again, I'm years and years out of doing drugs. Right. But when I used to do drugs, meth was not in the in the mainstream world in New York. In LA, right. it was everywhere. Right. You know, in, in 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 where I was in California, it was everywhere. Obviously, Texas, you watch Breaking Bad or right. or that crate or Spun or any it of was, those. It started as crack for poor white people. 
Right. That's what it was. And, you know, I put it I, in the book also. I, I remember uh, there's a guy named Cook in the book. And he would explain to me, he's like, this, re these recipes, like in the hills of these southern states are passed down from father to son, from uncle to nephew. And they're taught like moonshiners, right? And it all changed, and uh, and and it's basically it's a it's a family thing to cook. The family cook. The family cook. And I West mean, Virginia is fucking horrible. West Virginia, the yeah. hill, the Smoky Mountains, yeah, Tennessee, yeah, yeah, all yeah. those places are wild, man. And and I mean that's why the the trailer parks is where it blew up first. But now you're seeing rich white kids in in, in affluent communities doing it, you know. And uh, it really opens a portal to hell that people don't imagine. That's why I have this ministry against crystal meth today because I think when people get into it, they only see, if meth wasn't fun, nobody would do it. If, if it was just your fucking teeth falling out and it was just a life of crime and jails, institutions and death, nobody would do it. It starts off being very fun, very sexual, very exciting. And I mean, look, the book is like this, the best, this is how I describe it. It's like if Die Hard, Fifty Shades of Grey, and Harry <laughs> Potter had a baby on fucking meth. Okay. And that's what it's like. That's a great commercial. That's a great commercial, but I mean, that's what the life is like. It's supernatural, number one. Talk more about, like, when when do the demon signs on the road start to show themselves? Because this is the period we're talking about. And yeah. maybe the old lady in the wheelchair was the first... For the, yeah. first, the first sign. I mean, the demonic sex is part of it, and I think you start inviting more evil things into your life. I mean, as far as like the supernatural stuff, my house was so bad. You know, we used to have this room that they would nickname the haunted room. It would be like 25 degrees colder or hotter, depending on the day. And it was like bare concrete. The house was like bare concrete, holes in the wall and shit like that. This is trap house life, okay? Um, and it's just like, People would show up. I had a free place to do drugs and there was a lot of drugs around. Some stuff was going on at like three o'clock in the morning where people that I'd never met before would come for the first time and they would leave and say, I'm never returning there because they were so fucking spooked. Like there was some wild stuff going on. The devil's out. It's when, when I, this chair might break. My dad has. It's all right. I'm going to be careful. Yeah, be careful. I told you I liked Chris Farley. I don't want to be like Chris Farley. We had a, a, a convention, a big live event, mm -hmm. and we brought, because I'm an idiot, we used my dad's jeans. Yeah. <laughs> there was in the event, and one of them broke on stage in front of 200 people. Okay. And a dude plummeted. Yeah. It was fairly funny. I mean, it would be some good footage. <laughs> if you broke another chair, it would be a dopey classic. Right. Um, when I, It's funny that you say everything that you say because I, I'm a little bit disconnected from the periods of my own life. Yeah. And when I, was, when I was shooting meth, I lived in a garage in 100 degree heat in LA, no air conditioner, no nothing. And I would just shoot meth and shoot dope. And uh, it was like, I almost don't, I, I would also eat so many benzos that I wouldn't remember what right. was happening. But it was, it's like shades of serious loneliness and crazy fucking tweaker shit. Grandiosity, man. Right. And then I, you know, so but let's set the stage for the next, for the supernatural transformation of the story. Okay. Please. So this is like, I'm experiencing the devil in huge ways. Right. And then um, all of a sudden it's, it's a balmy October night, 2017. Okay. And I'm driving. I was working way too much is how I'll describe it. And I'm driving down. The town was dry. I was, you know, I was looking around. I only had to make it one exit up the road. So I'm driving and uh, all of a sudden I wake up. There's, a, there's horns honking and stuff. And I'm like, okay, I can make it one more exit. And I just fell asleep and I woke up airborne. I heard a loud crash. I woke up airborne. And I remember looking, I come down, all four tires were popped. I'm driving a, a, a Crown Victoria police interceptor model. It was an old cop car turned cab, right? So I start screeching towards this thing and I had three flashes. That's what my friend Todd drove too, by the way. Yeah. Fucking weird. He was a wow. addict. Todd drove the same car. Same car. Yeah, same, same car. Yeah, and I drove like a cop. Man. Yeah, yeah, so did he. I, I was, yeah. It's a meth thing, I think. It's a meth thing. I mean, and people thought I was a cop because I drive like a cop. I, I, I show up, I show up out of the blue with a Boston accent, not from there. Nobody knows me and I'm in like my mid thirties and look, I, I look like a fucking cop. <laughs> With the hat, no, but without no, the hat. Without no, the hat, yeah. yeah. I mean, so, 
you know, uh, that rumor went around, around too, you know. So, so you, you, you black out. I'm, I'm, now I'm, I'm wide awake and I'm seeing this pole. The, it's a concrete pole the size of a redwood tree. I sent you the picture of it. So I'm screeching toward it. I had three flashes. It's just like in a movie where they describe where time like slows down. It's going frame by frame. I remember thinking, I was like, oh shit, that's concrete. That was the first one. The second one is I saw, um, I saw the face of my littlest girl. And I remember like having this feeling of peace. And then the third one, I accepted my death. I'm like, I'm going fast. I'm, I'm, not, I'm gonna die. I was pretty sure. And I got right with God at that moment. And I kept my eyes open at impact. And then I saw a flash of hot white light. It was the concussion from the accident. And then all of a sudden the engines in the front seat, the car like tuna cans around me. And um, I actually sawed all five ribs completely in half. They weren't even touching anymore. Oh my, my heel was, my sneaker was broken because underneath the seats are only like that much space in those cop cars. My heel was trapped under the seat. Sorry, you know, sitting there, the car's on fire now. Blue oil smoke just billowing into my lungs. I had a superficial cut here that looked like a chainsaw had cut my arm off. There was so much blood. Broken glass in my eyes. So I opened the door. So I took the seatbelt off. I opened the door and I puked out the side of the car. And I got out and I started hobbling around, walking around going, oh my God. Oh my, you're just in complete shock. And then the cops come onto the scene, passed out go to the ER, you know, and then a week later, I actually like, I had something in my bank bag and I was worried about it. And the car was on fire. I couldn't get to it. In the bank. I don't want to go that far, okay. but I, I just want to say it's something I was concerned about. And well, I- Aren't we past the point of the statute of limitations? Or I, don't, I don't want to take the chance, but- <laughs> There's but something in the bag. There's something in the bag I was concerned about. I think everybody can draw their own conclusion. So um, so the EMT comes in. The whole family's there. Girlfriend, ex-wife, they're there. Dad's there. Everybody leaves the room for a minute. They just did the x-rays. So the EMT comes in and throws the bank bag at me and hits me and slides down. He goes, hey, we found your ID and your, uh, and your money and stuff in there. And I looked in the cigarette pack and boom, it was in there. And I pulled the IVs out and I hobbled out the side door. And that's that's how 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 deep my addiction was, right? Where did you go? I went back home. And for two weeks. And then I ended up back in the ER. But this is the thing is I took this picture about a week later. And, and I believe that God allowed me to go back to the scene of this. I was, I was dropping somebody off to do a drug test right next door to this place a week later. So I take this photo and then upon maybe like a couple weeks later, I'm zooming in and uh, I ended up, I fell asleep and I crashed into the sign at the Christian Sleep Study Center. And the sign had dropped on the top of the cab. God dropped a sign on my head to try to get me to take my foot off the fucking gas. And I didn't listen to him even then. I remember in the book the when you're visited by that crazy drugged out lady that you only could describe as a demon. Yeah. <clears throat> How many times do you think you were visited by demons? You're talking about the one at the yeah. office. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just read that on the way over here. And and that was before that was when I first started dabbling. And they had blessed the office. And that that girl came in and tried to put her foot on the floor and she could not. I mean, how they, do they bless an office? They, they take holy water or anointing oil and they say prayers and smudge it over the door frames and stuff. How often do people do that? Uh, usually when people move into a new house and stuff, it's big with Christians, big with Catholics and stuff like that. They want to demon proof that place. Yeah. And you know what? I didn't believe in that shit back then. I didn't. I'm a believer in God and the devil because I had real life personal experiences. I've had take your breath away type shit. Sparks flying out of stoves. I mean, tell, wild. Tell, tell us, please. Well, I, I was with a very evil girl. I mean, she had something evil with her. I'll say that. She laughed like the Joker. I met her on a dating site. And Which uh, dating site? Uh, it was one of the just normal ones. I, can I just say, I think it was like POF or something like that. You know, and I hadn't smoked any ice since like four in the afternoon. It's now like three o'clock in the morning. So she's laughing like the Joker. I take her home anyway, because I just don't give a buck, you know, back then. So we're having the first normal conversation of the night. 
sinks behind me, stove tops right here, countertop goes around like this. So she's like right here, sinks to my back, stove's right here. She's got her arms up on the counter like this and she's just talking to me or whatever. I saw, it didn't make any noise or anything like that. It was flashes of like hot white light. Looked like, looked like electricity almost. But it was flashes of hot white light. And then it just went, and then it took kind of a blob form and went around the corner. And I thought I was seeing shit, but it like took my breath away. It was so real, right? And I looked at her and I said, did you see that? And she looked, she had her hands and she goes, no, but I felt it. And her eyes were wide as dinner plates, dude. Like she felt it. I didn't tell her what I was seeing, but she felt something behind her. And then uh, as soon as she said that, a pyre of sparks shot out of this missing knob on the stove. And it was like, there was no running water all day. My dad was paralyzed with spinal cancer down the hall. He's got spinal cancer and I'm a full-blown IV junkie and I'm his caretaker. And we had to rewire the stove the next day. What do you think, you were talking about red phosphorus and, and how it becomes this sort of voodoo right. conduit. Do you think that your experiences around demonology, demonic forces were 100% connected to the fact that you're ingesting all of this meth? Yeah, I mean, 100%. And I mean, there was there was points near the very end where like, I would start keeping the pipe in a box, a wooden little box, and I started using it as a ceremonial tool to conjure the devil. I, and I didn't, I didn't think of it as the devil, but I just knew I was conjuring something that would come into me that would allow me to act in strange and mysterious ways and let me do things that I normally wouldn't do. What were the things that you wanted to do with that? I mean, it was like sexually based, you know? And that's what drove me. It was like the sex and the meth addiction, but it was, that's all designed to break your spirit and to totally shame you and make you feel so dirty that you continue on the path. And I think a lot of addicts are reading the book. I get messages from Brisbane, Australia, Auckland, New Zealand, South Africa, all over the planet, coast to coast, to the United States from people that are all feeling the same way. People saying they cried when they read it. People saying they were triggered. People don't like the cover of the book sometimes. And I'm like, okay, it's, it's a needle and a dough pipe in the shape of a cross. And I said, if you don't like the way that that looks on the cover, you should absolutely, certainly don't look inside because it's gonna take you, it's gonna show you a portrait of what hell really looks like. It's gonna show you, yeah, it's, it's about demonic stuff, but it's also the physical manifestation about what that spiritual affliction looks like as far as like the needles, the disease, the cheating on your partner, the fighting, I mean, the full-on debauchery, you know, full-fledged debauchery. How long did you drive the cab? Um, I would say probably like 2017 and 18. I'd say like two years. And how did it, what was the worst shit that happened in the cab? I mean, like, the cab was really a lot more of a tamer place than you would think. The cab was. The personal car was different because in the cab, you're on full audio-visual. Right. There's front and rear facing cameras, so everyone's instructed to be little good little boys and girls. So you're not smoking meth in the cab? No. No. I mean, you take breaks and stuff like that and, and everything like that. But yeah, I mean, you kind of had to be very careful in the taxi cab. You know, even though there was stuff going on, but it was just very silent. And it looked like a normal cab ride, and it was anything but a normal cab ride. It was almost like the, the, the last place that you had before total bedlam hit. Right. Because and you couldn't, you couldn't be the demon kind of thing. No. So like the cab was for earning and the rest of the time during the day was for debauchery. And when you stop doing the cab, like how full on are you at that point? So the cab, after the accident, the cab's gone. All of a sudden, um, what was the cab that you crashed? Yeah. What were the, what were the, uh, I didn't even get a speeding ticket. No consequences. Absolutely nothing. And and I was just let go from the job. That couldn't have been helpful. Well, they the didn't. Balance. I don't think that they wanted, like, they don't. They didn't. They didn't do a blood draw or nothing. I don't think that they wanted bad press that there's junkie cab drivers running around town. Junkie cab drivers running around town. How could there possibly? Right. Be? It's not true. Right. So so uh, you get out of the cab and how do you? 
Also, like, where does all the sex come from? Like, how do you meet women all over the place? Well, you know, so, all right, so this ties into that. I start, the, the, the days right after the accident, I start seeing these bright lights, like, in a stage in my mind, like, on a black stage, and it had, like, words spelt out, and it said, find the others. And the other one was the big event. I know what find the others means. Like, I'm doing that now. I'm finding the other spiritually gifted people that came out of that life. But... The big event, I have no clue. But I started thinking I was going crazy. I thought I had a head injury from the accident. And I'm like, I'm sane, so I'm not telling people about this at this point. I mean, and then you flash forward a few months, and I start going through what they call medically deep methamphetamine psychosis, right? So God gives me this sign that I should stop and take my foot off the gas, and I refuse. I call it the Nebuchadnezzar effect. It's a story in the Bible where this king goes crazy. He comes out the other side. He gets healed. And then whatever he saw in between, he's now a believer in God. Okay? That's exactly what happened to me. So I, uh, I start to... It's the women, right? So I start getting these delusions that these girls would just start knocking on the, my door. I, I lived in the country club estates. We called it the trap in the country club. Okay? Affluent neighborhood. These girls would show up, uh, my friend called them bitches with bags. They'd show up with trash bags. It's like a signature in the meth game. They would show up and they would, a stranger, just knocking on the door. Hey, can I come on in and party? And then I'm like, yeah, cool. And they would usually bring the stuff. Because now I don't, I'm not earning. And I'm like, David, I'm good looking, but I'm not that good looking. Right? So I start getting this delusion in my head that these women are being sent. Okay. Well, how would they know? How would they know to go to your house? So there's a, well, all right. Oh, how would they know? And so in real life, I mean, just the word of mouth, it's the drug uh, underground railroad. It was a stop on the underground meth railroad. And when you had money, it was flowing. Yeah. And, and, and if you have a place to stay, so, you know, mom and dad, if your kid's got a meth problem, don't let them live at your house because your house becomes currency. The drug dealer will come over or the girls will come over. People will bring drugs, get your kid high, and then- So they have a place to get high. They have a place to get high and stay and leech and eat your food and, and steal and everything else. So, um, you know, and that happens all the time all over the world, you know, and people are taken advantage of because they don't know any better. But, um, so they start showing up in greater frequency and I start to believe that they're sent. Now the gang stalking, I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Those are some of our biggest videos we do on YouTube is about gang stalking where people make an enemy in the meth world. And there's a ton of other crazy theories about that. But in my experience uh, in the drug and the meth world where you'd be targeted by a person or a group and they would torture you mentally. They would send people, pretend they don't know each other, secret like double talk languages. And I ended up seeing it. it's a real fucking thing. Explain that a little bit more. So like say you took somebody's girlfriend, just hypothetically, or you ripped somebody off on a drug deal. And I've seen stuff like this really happen. They would start like sending people to your house or playing mental games. It's a mental mind game. Ultimately, they want you to like hurt yourself. Okay. And they drive you crazy and they know you're high. Myth is such a psychedelic stimulant. And, and the more you do the more surreal things gets. It's a lubricant for insanity. Well, it's, I feel like it's more paranoid than psychedelic. Like psychedelic is, is like open. Yeah. And that, that thing where you're wondering what the fuck is going on is closed. Yeah. Like, I think it's different. Like, like, would you, how, or tell me more about, like, I mean, how you describe... people, the, the shadow people, those are, that's the other huge one. It just seems about. like the opposite of psychedelic, like mm. psychedelic, like I get the idea. But yeah. psychedelic to me is an open space where like light is and it's like it's not shadow people. It's not like this it's it's like the, the bad trip as yeah. opposed to the good one. Right. The shadow people are everybody knows they're coming to get me, paranoia, and I know that you suffered. Well people think shadow people are demons. That's what I mean, there's dark entities and stuff that starts showing up. Now this is the thing all over the planet people having the same mass delusion describing things exactly the same way it kind of makes you think is there something more spiritual to it i mean people that have never met never talked this is this has been going on way before the times of online forums and everything and and that's the number one thing i get about the book is and the stories that are in it is oh my god 
somebody's actually talking about this and I've never been had the courage to say it because they would have called me crazy. Tell me more about some of those things. Like, like I hear what you're saying. Like if people who do meth all see these shadow people, right? How, how real is it? Like, is it, is it real? And are they demons and who is coming? What are some of the things in the book that really triggered that response in, in the meth world out there? You know, I think the, the part where the girl was gyrating like a puppet on the rusty yeah, yeah, strings, yeah, 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 yeah. like people acting like that, um, people seeing things, That's audible straight, hallucination. Demonic thing. Yeah. And Aw it's always evil. It's always evil. I mean, I've been around evil situations the whole time. I mean, I was a strip club manager, you know? And there was a part in the book where I was looking across the club and describing the diamond eyes of the, the beast in the audience and stuff. Like, I mean, it's just a wild, wild lifestyle. And it just has, it has evil undertones to it all the way through. Now, when you're in it and you've renounced your family and you've renounced your freedom and you, and, and like when you keep the pipe in the wooden box, right? What, what's really that about? Well, I mean, it was a ceremonial tool that I was using. When did it become one? Um, I would say like near the middle to the end of before I got clean. Now, this is the thing, whether you want to believe in the spiritual nature of crystal meth or not, there's a very, very real spiritual underworld lurking just behind the shadows of your little city and town. If John and Jane on Main Street knew what was lurking in the shadows behind their lily white community, they probably wouldn't leave the house. I'm talking about covens of witches. I'm talking about people who are divinators, who speak to the dead, people who claim to see the future. There's real people in real trap houses with real six foot tall Santa Muerta statues when they cook the big batches of dope in Mexico, and when they do it here in the United States, they hold a ceremonial black mass. And they pray over these batches of dope before they're shipped to traps all over the city. So if it's not, if the supernatural is not real, why are people wasting their time putting black juju on this ice before it's shipped all over the city? What have you seen like that? I have seen that. I wrote about it. And, and there was a house I was living at where uh, some some uh, bad motor scooters, man, they, 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 were, um, they were the hood fables told by vampires with blood on their teeth. And it's like the, the stories that would go around, they would wear black cloaks. And it was a ceremony. I mean, they're not like big monstrous demons. These are real people saying real prayers of darkness over the batches of dope before it shipped out. So you're getting indoctrinated into that world. And yeah, I mean, I'm rubbing shoulders with everybody in it. And, and is that when it becomes clear that this is a ceremonial tool, that I am part of this dark... I could feel it. Talk. I could feel the possession of and sexuality. Before you even say another thing, mm -hmm. I want to thank you. Like, I'm not trying to indict you here. Yeah. Like, this is a story, like, that I think benefits our community. And, like... I'm very, very grateful that you're here. So if I'm pressing you for you're shit, okay. it's because I want to hear No, and, stuff. and I talk about this every day on my TikTok. We're a community of people that is literally a movement. It's starting to take off all over the planet. And it's people coming together and telling their experiences. And I'm watching people's lives be restored by talking about this stuff. Stuff that's been hidden in the shadows for years. We were the first people to start. Me, Jamie Tall, Sonia Johnson, we were online about a year ago. The book came out on Halloween by chance. I didn't do it on purpose. I, I dropped it. And then Amazon takes a couple of days. Came out on Halloween day, the paperback. And we, I did my first interview and I met these people that were talking about the spirit of witchcraft in the meth game. And, and I was doing it individually. And then we linked up and I mean, it, it blew up online. Where did, where, when was the first time you encountered the dark magic, witchcraft, that stuff? Cause you were just, you see, yeah, my girlfriend was a card reader. I mean, there it's, it's everywhere. I mean, the supernatural, like the spiritual part is all over the meth game. It was the whole time. It was the whole time. But there's different people. I mean, I've met Jesus freaks out there. I've met legit Satanists out there. I've met people that could really tell you things before they happen. We've seen wild stuff. But you came in wanting to be Chris Farley, and, and which is like funny and light. And, and you're some kid from Massachusetts. And right. now you're getting indoctrinated into this yeah. dark world. I changed. 
I changed and I became a very dark character. I was never evil, like as far as hurting people, but I was just very, I, I took meth to a, a point where no human being should take it. I was an eight ball a day meth user. Now I'd spread that around a little bit, you know, it wasn't all me, but I would buy for a long stretch and 3.5 grams a day. And I took it to an extreme. And then I ended up going into deep methamphetamine psychosis. I end up thinking these women are being sent. Then meth psychosis is, I describe it as a snowball that rolls downhill. All of a sudden, I start to believe that I'm in a hidden camera movie. First, it was like just hidden cameras in the walls and stuff. And then I'm like, they're following me wherever I go. I start believing that they're filling me with satellites. Then I believe that I'm in this movie that's the Truman Show reboot. And I actually believe Jim Carrey is an executive producer on the movie. Jim, if you're watching, I'm still waiting on my check. Because, uh, yeah, I was real out question, there. You know what the real question is, though? Huh? It's like, when does it stop? Like, how, like, here we are. You're, and now you're we're recording this yeah and and however many people are going to see it however many people are going to hear it right and you've kind of manifested that it is a movie yeah because now you're being recorded right do you know what i'm saying like right. so, so when do you get out of that thinking because i know you were deep in it you had you would tell talk to your dad about it your friends my about dad it. was i i mean there's a story where the swat team surrounded the house with my dad because, Tell the story, please. Well, I, I got out of jail one day. I came home and I was desperate. I mean, this was my reality. And I was being tortured by this Hollywood machine that... In your head. Well, yeah, I thought it was my reality. But it was in my head. So I get out of jail. They broke my seventh floating rib. I came home. I took the bus home. And I walked in. My dad was now paralyzed in a wheelchair. He's still working because I'm a junkie and a loser. And I can't pay a bill. So I go and get a fillet knife. And I come in. You see that big vein on my arm? I put the knife to my vein and I said, Dad, I said, you're going to tell me about this movie right now, today. I'm like, I know you're in on this. And I was dead serious. I took his phone and I put it out of his arm's reach. And I said, I need to know. And he's like, Patrick, there's no movie. And he started to cry. He goes, you're really sick and you need help. Those moments came from time to time where I'm like, maybe I'm mentally ill. Maybe he's right. You're like, maybe, maybe this is, maybe that is the truth. Right. And then someone called the police. The SWAT team surrounds the house, okay? And this is where it always it always happened. I finally surrender. My dad's shouting through the window. He's like, he's not he's not hurting me. He's not hurting me. So I, the cops, I come outside or whatever. I had a bookcase up against the front deal. And, um, hold up. Yeah. And uh, so the, I go outside and the cops handcuff me and put me in the back seat of the car. So I get in the back seat of the car and uh, and the cop goes and gets a Pepsi and gummy bears out of the house and he starts feeding me the shit with my handcuffs behind my back. I'm like, this is a fucking movie. They take me to the hospital. I'm doing stand-up comedy for everybody. They treated you well. Yeah, I'm, I will, and then I'm like, cops don't do this. So this is definitely part of the movie. How do you not get in trouble for something like that? So then um, I'm getting thrown out of every restaurant at this point. I'm doing stand-up in the middle of Walmart on the counter. I'm thinking I'm being filmed and I'm doing these epic scenes. So eventually my dad disappears. I thought he went to play golf in Hawaii because he was written out of the script. I mean, this is legit. Because it's deep, deep meth psychosis. Deep, deep. I mean, as far in as you could get. And then uh, that's when the McDonald's shit happened. Was... How are you affording it at that point? I, you know, to be honest, near the very end, I wasn't even using that much. You were just gone. I was just so far spun out that I could use once every four days and it would just make me even worse. But the kicker is, is like, I had enough. They, the cops boarded up the house when it was 110 degrees. Every window is busted out. All the walls are torn down. The house is destroyed. My dad's missing. They, they come with the screw guns. I'm in the bathroom with a needle in my arm. So then... Um, you know, things deteriorate. I'm, I'm doing missions now where I'm going out to preach the word of Jesus Christ to the homeless. I'm having major jaw-dropping experiences with the devil. I'm having major, major moments in the trap house where I'd have the blowtorch in one hand and then the flame of God would come and sit next to me. And I would feel this overwhelming feeling of love and just um, butterflies in my stomach to the point where you'd puke. It was happening all the time. It changed me from the inside out. Okay, this is while I'm crazy. I, uh, one day I walked home. Somebody told me my dad was really dead. It was three. He's been dead for three weeks. 
something clicked. I went home and I and I said I have to surrender. I drank a bunch of like four locos and passed out on the bed, covered in self-inflicted knife wounds. I mean, I was the man from Gadarenes, the demon possessed man. I mean, I I was tortured. I was wearing swim trunks. The house is just five feet tall of trash and needles everywhere. It's it's disgusting. And I woke up and looked over on the nightstand. There was a big butcher knife. And I looked and I said, okay. I grabbed the knife and I stood up and I said verbally out loud, I said, this ends now. And I stormed out the front of the house. I took a TV that was on the front lawn. I threw it through a closed window. I threw it over the, the neighbor's fence. It hit their house. They ended up calling the cops thinking I was breaking in. I went around the block and I went into a fast food restaurant and, uh, and I poked my head in the door and I said, this is not a robbery. Everybody get the fuck up out of here. The four employees ran out the back door. I threw the knife on the floor. I went and got me a burger. Do you know why you said this is not a robbery? Because I didn't want to go to jail for robbery. I was just, this was a cry for help. This was me just trying to get arrested long enough where I could get clean in jail. Treatment refused me twice the months leading up to this. The, I was being kicked out of mental hospitals every three days. So as deranged you are, you knew you needed to do some a final moment. move to get help. It, at that moment, I had a moment of clarity, and I'm like, this, I can't do it anymore. It's, it's a very weird moment of clarity, though. Yeah. To be like, I'm going to go, I'm going to get treatment by going and stealing a burger with a knife at McDonald's. Well, because they, they kept, I would go to the mental hospital, and in three days, they'd turn me out. The mental health system and the drug treatment facility industry in this country is broken. And we need a reform of it, right? So I went in there and the crime should have never taken place, but I was dying and I risked it all to get clean. When they say going to any length, I went to any length. And I don't recommend that to anybody because they charged me with aggravated armed robbery, five to 99, three counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, two to 20 each. That's 156 years stacked in the state of Texas. Well, you went to the only length that you that that you were told what to, that, they, that was what you were, your impulse to do to get right. well was. You didn't know what to do. You did that, and it started you on a path. Right. But, you, I mean, like, when they say go to any length, right? It, it's, it's, it's not usually go no. with, take a knife to McDonald's and no. tell everybody to get out of there. And but that's, a, it went, it, it spiraled so far out of control. It was the only avenue I thought I had at the time. You, you, it's, it's like we said before we even started. It doesn't even matter because it's what got you here. Right. And then I, I'm in Nueces County Jail. The psychosis gets worse as I'm off drugs. I started becoming a Christian during this time. And, and I'm a very different type of Christian. A lot of Christians don't like me and that's okay. I use a potty mouth and I have beliefs that aren't of the norm. Okay. I believe God loves all people. I don't think he just loves Christians. I mean, I felt the spirit of God. I met the real Jesus Christ. Okay. I didn't see him ever, but I felt it, right? And it changed me. And um, I'm in jail, and I start to have this delusion that they put cameras, the movie put cameras behind my eyes. They could see exactly what I did. And I mean, this is months with no drugs. And I start reading the Holy Bible. I read the New Testament three times. I'm awaiting trial. I'm talking to the weatherman thinking he could hear me on TV. And we're having a full conversation, and I woke up, and I was completely healed. But here's the kickers and the miracles start, okay? Unbeknownst to me, my attorney, I won in a lottery, was the number two pay attorney in the city of Corpus Christi. He was a bad motherfucker, man. He looked like Martin Scorsese. I thought he was part of the movie. <laughs> he looked just like a, like a fucking movie. Insanity defense gets rejected. Everything falls apart. You know, so I'm, I'm facing all this prison time and... You know, unbeknownst to me, like the insanity trial that gets, uh, my insanity defense gets rejected. Okay. So I get healed. And all the charges are for the McDonald's. Crime. All of it. Which is not really a crime. Really. No, but they tried to they, get a free burger. They wanted to give me 15 years in prison for this. It was my first felony arrest ever. My, my lawyer was telling me that they wanted to make an example out of me because I was waging war on the south side of town. I was banned from every single business for doing like stand up, causing problems, like doing these acting out these scenes for the movie. OK, so he's like, they just don't want to deal with you. They know you're mentally ill and they don't want to deal with this anymore. So they hit you with some very serious charges. I should have got probation, but they wanted to make an example that you can't walk into a public business with a huge machete the size of your arm or and book, scare the kitchen world. knife. Yeah, and scare terrorize, people. Terrorize, terrorize the town. I was terrorizing the town. So, um, so I go to, I, I'm about ready to go to trial and I call this guy the night before trial. Okay. And I'm like, Hey man, what are we looking at now? I'm healed just like I am now. And I'm like, 
are we looking at probation or whatever? This is my first time. He goes, I'm sorry. I'm like, he's like, you're facing? He goes, they're asking for about 15 years in TDC. I went back and I screamed into my towel, my little square towel I had. The conditions in Wayne's County Jail were harsh. It's one of the worst county jails in the country to do time. There was rats in my bed, cockroaches, everything, okay? Um, so it was hard time in there and I'm getting ready. And I had a moment of clarity again. And I said, the aggregation of every bad choice that I ever made since the time I was 13 years old led to me to this moment right here. And now, when I got healed, I was a full on believer in God, okay? And, and I loved him um, because I felt how he felt about me. And he taught me a lot of things in my insanity that I'll never forget. And I remember thinking to myself, if I have to go to prison, I'll go there as a man of honor, integrity, and respect, and I'm gonna do the best that I can to bring people to God, right? I went in through this leaky tunnel the next morning, swinging lights, water leaking out of the pipes. There's 12 of us shackled together, which is like very symbolic later on, okay? And we're walking hand and foot shackles, orange jumpsuits. I'm going to a bench trial with just me and the judge, okay? Um, I walk and I see something up in the distance, and I pass it, it's the same make, model, and color wheelchair my dad had when he had spinal cancer in the middle of this tunnel in the middle of nowhere. Was it also the same wheelchair the old lady had on the I, side? I of think it was. It probably was. Maybe that's why I got so excited. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I walk up into the courtroom. Martin Scorsese's there. He's mm. like, get in this side room. And it's a movie. It's the Shawshank Redemption. This is the right? Shawshank Redemption, right? I mean, but this is real life now. Of course. So he pulls me in the side room. He's like, we beat the case. We beat the case. And I said, what do you mean we beat the case? I was like, you told me 15 years last night on the phone. I was at the DA's office last night on unrelated business after hours, like seven o'clock at night. He's got my, his briefcase with my files, with all my medical shit from when I was crazy. The DA caseload in real life had switched that day by chance. And I mean by God, because it it's part of a fucking plan, okay? It switched. And he presents my files. He's like, I got this crazy guy tomorrow at 8 o'clock in the morning. Now, usually in an insanity defense trial, they'll go back on your Facebook for six months. They'll see if drugs are part of your story. Automatically disqualified. They already disqualified me. Um, because of the drugs. Because of the drugs. It's like a drunk driving accident right. or whatever, right? So then um, he says that the guy goes, yeah, we'll push it through. 1% of felons who try to get an insanity defense in front of a judge get it even heard. 24% of the 1%, so less than a quarter of 1% actually get off an insanity. And just to put this in perspective, Jeffrey Dahmer's insanity defense was rejected because he was too sane. Well, you were crazy enough for it to, right. for it to work. Right. That was and the blessing. It was it. You know, I'm going to see the judge with a full mohawk with soap spiked up. Like I, And I, I was a crazy guy. I was, I was crazy. Thinking I was seen playing, playing a crazy cra playing guy. Crazy. Yeah, it's in the book. It's wild. I based the story off of that. And you got out of it. I got an NGRI not guilty by reason of insanity. I beat the case with absolutely no criminal record. But here's the kicker. As part of my release, I had to go to a mental institution for the criminally insane. And I had to go for a safety evaluation. I went to Vernon Supermax in Vernon, Texas. It's mental institution for the criminally insane with true blue serial killers. I'm in there with people who drown their children in bathtubs, people who kill prostitutes up and down, you know, the Gulf Coast, um, the herders of women and children. I was in there with a guy who killed a pastor and stabbed three other people, a guy who smoked the chief of police of his town. Like, th these are like the worst of the worst, too crazy to go to trial in the state of Texas, and I was now betting down with them. Second day on the tier, they gave me the wrong medication at noon. I didn't take noon meds, and I said, I don't take noon meds. They gave me a bucket of pills and forced me to take them. They were like, you're taking those. And if you don't take them, they shoot you up with them. There's a restraints chair. Do you have any idea of what they were? Um, I have absolutely no clue. All I know is my heart started beating out of my chest, and I started drooling literally buckets. I've never experienced anything. And I almost, I thought I was going to die. They dragged me back to my bed and threw me into the bed. And people die in the state hospital system all the time. It's very, very crazy. And I lived there for eight and a half months of my life. Let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. You know, you had all those years um, doing math in, in Texas and being on this demon dark path. Yeah. How similar was it in this uh, mental institution? It, I mean, 
Can you picture hearing the hallowed screams of the damned almost all hours of the day? Did it did it did it affect you in a similar way? Or did oh, you feel yeah. like you were in the same continuum? I, I was around true evil, like, and now I'm completely healed. I think God showed me the demonic realm, and then healed me, and then now I can recognize it when I'm not high. You know, I mean, I was in there with a guy who was so dangerous. He was a serial rapist, and he had an ankle monitor in inside the walls of the institution. They didn't want to take any chances. Violent sexual thoughts, literally every waking moment, is what his medical file said. Right. I looked it up online. Scary. Yeah, and um, so I get moved to San Antonio State Hospital. They could have held me 99 years. I had to prove my sanity at this point. So what happened next was uh, I started taking on an evil, corrupt system. People would piss their pants and shit their pants, and because of clients' rights, they wouldn't, they couldn't force them to change. But they wouldn't, they wouldn't bribe them with an ice cream sandwich. You total abuse, sexual assault, patient on patient crime wasn't prosecuted by police. You, you, you lose all your human rights. Um, I saw a woman get almost brutally murdered underneath the tree outside at San Antonio State Hospital, and she was beaten by a big male patient and he was kicking her right in the face over. She was in a wheelchair for about a month after that. I started taking journals and writing names, dates, times of patients down. I started recording everything. I ended up getting uh, the client's rights handbook and reading it like a maniacal And this genius. is when your brain is coming back. Oh, I'm and, fully and, and, and you And you recognize how to be on the side of good. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and I became like a, a warrior for people who didn't have a voice. So one day, everybody, I, I had my cell phone. My mom took the camera out. I found a loophole in the, they had to let me have a device. It was part of my client's rights. My mom gets the camera taken out. She sends me a phone. Now I've got Facebook. I've got uh, Google, YouTube, everything. Outside access to the outside world. Messenger, everything. This lady one day came up to me. The, everybody's banging on the windows. You have to go to a happy place when you live there. You have to look at the floor and you have to imagine yourself somewhere else because the speech you hear alone will drive you mad. Okay. It's, I mean, it's the craziest conversation you've ever had in your life on acid times 10. It's always about something involving children or murder or this and that. It's always wild. These, I mean, that's why I think it's demonic. Like these schizophrenic people that were in there were talking about the most vile things, the most vile to human behavior, despicable behavior you have ever seen. And it's co-ed. Just use your imagination what's going on. And um, I start to lose it one day. And if I lose it or raise my voice after beating a case of insanity, it's six more months. Six more months. If they give me the drugs, six more months. So the lady comes up, she goes, you're getting medicated. That's it. I'm like, I fucked up. I'm like, I just fucked up. Whatever reason, she had a heart and she came back. She goes, I'm going to give you one chance to calm down. Right. And then she looks at me. And this changed the course of my whole life. She goes, if you don't like the way things are here, Mr. Durkin... She said, uh, I suggest that you write a letter and I will personally take it up to the White House. It's where all the top brass in the administration was at. And she would personally hand deliver it to him. So I sat down and I wrote a, f a four page letter in five minutes that ultimately set me free. That's why I wrote the book too, is because I saw the power of the pen and the spoken word. I was like, if it can set you free from a 99 year psych hold in an institution where they get paid $1,100 a day and sell you pills, then it can take you around the world and change the world. How did it set you free from the place? So in the letter, I said, I am well-educated. I am not crazy. Your doctors have taken me off all but you medications. you were not well-educated. No, 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 I, I wasn't. But you know what? I picked up a lot of knowledge. I'm just I'm just <laughs> I think it's great. Yeah, and I'm like, I'm well-spoken. I had a business career. I told him kind of who I was. Right. And I was like, check my files. I have a cell phone that I have in here legally. It's in my file. I said, I have names, dates, and times of all these crimes. X, Y, Z started naming stuff. And I was like, I have all of this. And I'm going to start to release my journals to the local and state media. So the longer you keep me here the longer I'm going to be a major problem for your so they're like, we don't, system. we don't want to deal with you. Yeah. But then there's a lot of red tape involved. They had, they had agreed to let me go after the first letter. There was a secret meeting held. Staff was friendly with me. They're like, you shouldn't even be here, man. Right. So I made friends with like the low level staff members. They were to one guy was like, listen, man, that letter that you wrote, they had a secret meeting up at the white house and they moved me to the Fannin unit, all male, full of child molesters and murderers and stuff. And I thought it was a punishment for the letter, but in reality, there was actually less problems on that unit and they didn't want me to see things to make a problem out of it. So I, re I ended up writing 12 letters in all because I was in this holding pattern and everywhere they moved me, something would pop up. 
and then my roommate escapes, it's the final straw. So if you get on YouTube and you YouTube San Antonio, like the city, state hospital escape, one of those top three videos right there, it'll have the one with the kid with the big puffy hair. He's a guy, he was my roommate. Threatened to kill his family a few days before the hospital covered it up. They covered up all these molestation things that were happening with a patient that had HIV. I uncovered that. I was bribing like the victims with sodas and uh, bags of candy, my mom would to say. To get the, get the truth. I'd say, give me your sister's phone number. I'd call the sister. I'd be like, listen, you're going to have to believe me. I'm not crazy. I need you to call the hospital and verify that this, this, and this happened. Adult Protective Services comes swooping in. They're getting more mad. So you're becoming this incredible power of good. Yes. And I bet you it felt really good after all those years of being incredibly on the other side. Of it. Yeah, it was, you know, I went from living a terrible life to actually, like, I, I, I felt like I was making a difference on something, even though it was extremely scary because they they could have kept me my the rest of my natural life. So he escapes and hops the wall and he told me he was going to do it. And I'm like, you hear so much crazy shit. You don't believe you don't anything. Have, yeah. yeah, he's like, I'm going to go get this 20 grand, man. I'm like, yeah, fuck you. You know what I mean? So he hops the wall. He gets two mental patients that have the mind of an eight-year-old, forms a human ladder and climbs up and walks off the property. They tell the cops, but they don't call the media. So the city of San Antonio, the citizens don't know there's an escaped mental patient on the loose. I get on my phone like an hour after it happens. And uh, I get on there with Ken's five. Okay. And I'm like, do y'all want a story about an escaped mental patient? The guy, whoever it was on the other end messages back and goes, you can't have a phone in the state hospital. So quick thinking, I dropped the GPS pin from inside the fan end unit. All of a sudden a message comes through. I, I need the guy's name. We've got to verify the story. They ran one story that night at 10. And I'm like, I got these motherfuckers, man. And then next morning they ran a big expose. And that's the story that you will see online. San Antonio State Hospital Escape. My social worker came down that Monday. They locked the gates of the facility for the first time in years. And she had a stack of folders and she goes, Mr. Durkin, my job is to get you out of here today. Wow. And they just had enough of Patrick Durkin, Boston 2%. And they just, you know, they were, they wanted me gone. And within 30 days I was home. I was a free man with no criminal record. I've since, you know, I wrote the meth Bible when I was homeless and clean. And you never picked up meth again? Never again. When you left that place, did you were you tempted to do anything? Listen, I got robbed for all of my inheritance, and the last of it was for eleven thousand dollars thirty days before my release. I came out on the streets homeless and clean with a duffel bag full of dirty mental institution clothes. I, I started writing the Meth Bible in a trap house hotel called the Knights Inn, where I used to do a lot of dirt. Two weeks after that, I'm in the middle of the second chapter. I move into an Oxford house. I start writing the book and then I Where was that in Texas? It's in Corpus Christi. I was back in the city, it all happened, homeless and clean. I could have gone back to the crime life anytime I wanted and had more money. How was the Oxford house? It was structured and a lot of rules, but really good. And and uh, I, I just lived there for like a month and a half, two months. The drug rehab center that I, that refused me treatment twice, I ended up working there when I got out. I was t just, just to have it as a cool story, I got a job there. Right. And then um, I ended up finishing the book on this canal house on Padre Island, right? I could dive off, I did, I, di I dove off the back porch. I'd be writing 14 hours, I'd take a break, I'd jump off the porch into the Gulf of Mexico. And then I came to Washington and completely changed my life. I'm an online recovery advocate. I'm an author of a book that's being read in seven countries right now. Um, I have an amazing day career where I've done, a, I, I estimate about $7 million in sales in three years. What are you selling? Um, I mean, <laughs> exactly. No. And you know, I, uh, I help a lot of people get off meth all over the world. And I'm no, watching. I mean, you are a conduit and you are proof that you can go from the darkest place to, right. to a, a light place. And, and here's a fucked up question. Uh -huh. I know you got to go soon. It's okay. Here's a fucked up question. When you get to the craziest places of paranoia, right? right, and you have an aside where you you'll say to the camera, "Oh, Jim Carrey, blah 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 blah." Yeah. Where does it live in your head? The deepest old school fucking. Like, how does it resonate with me now? I mean, like, once in a while, it probably feels like you're still in. A no, I've come to terms with it. I'm going to tell you what my thought on it is. I believe because I know me, I shouldn't have been able to write that book. I shouldn't have. I have like a sixth grade education. How did you do it? 
I sat down and started typing and I read, I wrote a 716 page book. I literally started it January 1st of 2020 and I finished it on, on July 1st, 2020. I never went back and changed anything. I was on Facebook live and you stuff. You didn't edit a bit of it. No, I, a lady edited the book for me. And, and, and who, and how, did you self publish it? I did. I, I, I was shopping it to traditional publishers, but it's too long of a book because it's too thick to, for them to make money. And it's too fucking crazy. Like they looked at it and they're like, this is too wild. There's never been a book like this written. So there's nothing like it. It's too dangerous. It's a great accomplishment. It's I a put great it out. Book. Dopey Nation, you gotta check it out. The, the meth Bible, the story was it story of fire and ice no it's fire and ice Thank the you. myth bible on amazon.com the audiobook just dropped too and right now it's free so just search i paid for the audiobook oh you did i did <laughs> it's it just searched the myth bible on amazon.com and it's all right there and uh yeah it's a wild book it's amazing that you sat down and wrote a book like that who who edited it Here's the, here's the thing. The lady who edited it, I, I was releasing short stories from inside the institution. There was so many people that wanted to edit it for free because the stories were good. I write the full length. I start sending it chapter by chapter as I go. The person who I picked was from Corpus. And I messaged her when she was on tap, chapter two. Her name's Sandra Lee. And I said, Sandra, I'm like, I saw that you work at this so-and-so place on your profile. She's like, yeah. And I'm like, my dad worked there. Okay. The character in the book's based on my dad. Okay, based. And then um, she's like, what department? And I said, well, he was in accounting. And she goes, what's his name? And I told her his name. And she said, oh my God, I'm the person who replaced your dad wow. when he had spinal cancer in real life. She edited that book for free. Wow. Yeah. And had you written before you got into the uh, mental institution? No, I found a gift to write at 37 years old after I went crazy and I was never able to do it before. Incredible. Yeah. There's something happened in my brain that opened it up to something in the ether that I can't explain. And where do you see, where do you see demons now? I don't see New York City. Yeah, New York City. You see a lot of them in my, in my dad's building. Right. No, I, I just you know, and uh, I'm I'm involved with a lot of things that are spiritual, and uh, you know, I'm a spiritual mentor for a lot of people. Demons don't really bother me too much anymore, but they, you know, the devil definitely comes after people around me for sure. No, I had one weird moment uh, when I was using. I had a friend who was really, really interested in in demons. He would talk to me about it all the time. Right. And um, we talk about the devil all the time. Yeah. And uh, and I didn't grow up with God or the devil or anything. Yeah. And um, I was living and I was shooting a ton of uh, heroin on the Lower East Side. Yeah. And I got it in my head that if I went into my closet and sat down and asked the devil to come. Right. He would. That's I asked that old lady in a wheelchair to come too. Did did. <laughs> But you know, so like right. I, I, and I, and I got really scared, and mm -hmm. and I, I knew that if I did that, the devil would come, right? And and maybe I would make a deal or whatever the case may be, right? And I opted not to do it, right? But that was like, there's lines, right, between this world and that world, right? And then there's, and then the further you get away from that world, there's all these buffers, yeah. But when you're there, you're there, right? And it, it's terrifying. I was at a crossroads moment like that. I was like, I could go all the way with God. I could go all the way with the devil. And there's a story like that in the book. But that's for y'all to decide. Have you seen Beyond the Veil? What's your experience? You know, that's what I leave it up to. What people to believe for themselves. I really got to go. Well, I'm glad you came. But I love you, man. And I, I will be so grateful to be on the same show as Nikki Six from Motley Crue and Jamie Lee Curtis, who Listen, played Laurie Strode in Halloween. But the bottom line is you smoked them on the show. So thank you. Oh, come on. <laughs> I love y'all. Thank you.